We are honored to have Professor Rob Muller as our next speaker. Professor Muller is a full professor in the MIT Electrical Engineering and Computer Science EECS department and a member of the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. He earned bachelor's and master's degrees in computer science from MIT in 1995 and PhD from CMU. He has won an ACM Distinguished Dissertation Honorable Mentioned NSF Career Award and six Best Paper Awards in U.S. and USNIX. He has been Program Co-Chair for U.S. 2010, General Chair for U.S. 2012, Associate Editor of ACM Tochi, Associate Director of MIT CCL, and Education Co-Officer of MIT EECS. He has won two Department Awards for teaching and was named a MacFig a MacFaker Faculty Fellow for Outstanding Contributions to MIT Undergraduate Education. His research interests lie at the intersection of programming and human-computer interaction, including cloud computing, online education, software development tools, and end-user programming. The title of his talk is Online Education with Learner Sourcing, Professor Rothmuller, please. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about some work that my group has been working on over the last couple of years. And the big idea that I hope you take away from what I'm going to say is uh, this notion of learner sourcing, which you should think of as crowdsourcing, where the crowd has been replaced specifically by a large group of learners which is exactly what we see online. And the, um, the domain that we're going to think about learner sourcing is in video learning, is in improving the video content that is delivered as part of many online learning experiences. So here's some examples. On the left, you see recorded video lectures like you might see in edX or Coursera. Um, on the right, you know, on the top, we've got Khan Academy, which was already mentioned this morning. Um, and on the lower right, this is just a cooking video that somebody on the internet has uploaded to YouTube. So there's lots and there's a very large diversity of learning content that's appearing online. The crowd is creating instructional content as well as using instructional content. And we're thinking about this whole uh, spectrum of, of information that's out there. So video has really made delivery of learning, delivery of instructional content scale. Um, it's taken what you know, used to be the one-on-one -on -one apprenticeship model and turned it into something that can be delivered in a MOOC to millions of people at the same time. The downside is that that's just because we're delivering it in a scalable way doesn't mean that people are actually learning in a scalable way. Um, that the traditional sort of direct interaction between a tutor and a student, or even between a lecturer and a group of students, has a lot of advantages. There's, there's high engagement. Because I'm looking at you, you feel like you have to pay attention to me. I can also be aware of whether you're paying attention to me or not. I can look around the room and see how well I'm doing. And if you're falling asleep, I might become more animated. Or I might repeat what I said, because you didn't hear it. Right? Um, so we get that feedback as, a, as an instructor, and we can adapt what we're doing. Even in, a, even in a lecture hall scale, there's an adaptation that can happen. Well, that goes away when we go to video. We've now got this mediator, this, this video interface between the instructor and the student and the learner. And for the learner, it's a very passive and isolated experience. You're not surrounded by other people who are giving you cues about how you should react or about whether they understand or not. You're just by yourself. Um, and it doesn't adapt to the learner. And it can be very difficult to, uh, to navigate with these video interfaces because they were really designed for television and movies. The, the video UI, the UI that we use for watching online learning content, whether it's a lecture or Khan Academy or a cooking video, it's the same UI that was developed for watching DVDs. 
right? And that's not adapted for learning. So in fact, that's going to be the area that I'm going to focus on, because my group does user interface design. So we're thinking about you know, this thing in the middle here and how we can make it work better for both the student and for the instructor. So we want to find out what learners are doing so that instructors can, in a sense, look at that sea of faces and get some feedback about what's happening with their videos. And we want the learner to be able to see more easily what's inside the video, and in particular for the video player interface to be more aware of what's inside the video so that it can present it better. Now, the idea that we're going to use to improve this video interface is crowdsourcing specialized to a crowd of learners. So crowdsourcing is um, it's an idea that's been around for about 10 years now. Um, and the, the basic idea of it is that people out on the internet, large group of people, are doing small bits of things that uh, allow us to solve problems that we, we don't know how to solve completely with artificial intelligence yet. And in return, the crowds might get small amounts of money, so that's what happens on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, they might get some fun out of it, that's what happens with games with a purpose. Um, or they might get some social connection out of it. So, Facebook, in a sense, is a large crowdsourcing platform. We're looking at how we use students, or learners in general, to, uh, to do small things that improve an online course, in particular improve the videos that you get from an online course. And what we want the learners to get in return for the small amounts of work that they've done is a better learning experience themselves. I'll say a little more about that uh, later in my talk. So there have already been examples of this idea. The discussion forums that are really essential to making MOOCs work are a kind of learner sourcing. People are choosing to answer questions that other people are posting. We have also seen peer instruction and peer grading being examples of learner sourcing, where the people in the class are helping to make the class run by teaching other people or by, um, um, by assessing other people's work. So learner sourcing is already happening. Um, I'm going to talk about two variants of it that uh, we've applied to improving videos. Um, one variant is sort of the big data world. So we just watch what learners are doing and don't actually interrupt what they're doing. So we're collecting data about thousands or millions of people that are interacting with our content, and we're using that data to make the experience better. And then the active learner sourcing is where we're actually going to ask particular learners to do particular things that are going to improve the, the video content. And actually, the, the act of doing something is going to improve that person's own learning experience, as, uh, um, as Dr. Terman said in his, in his lecture a moment ago. So let me say um, that's going to be the outline of my talk. I'm going to show you a, some work we've done on the passive side, where we've taken lecture videos of MOOCs and data from lots of learners who have been watching those videos and use them to improve the video playing interface. And we're going to look also at the active learning side, where now we're taking videos from YouTube so that were just uploaded by random people from the internet and added some exercises to them that allow us to improve those videos and make them easier to use. So let me dive into the passive learning side first. Um, and this is work done by my student, uh, Juho Kim. And so, when we look at uh, um, lecture videos for MOOCs, they tend to be played in an interface that you know, has a, a play button and a timeline, um, and that's pretty much it. You don't see what else is going on in this video. They're not really optimized for seeing what's going on, and furthermore, the teacher, the person who has created that video, doesn't have any sense for whether the video is actually working. You know, what are these moments of confusion? where maybe I need to explain it better. Right? Where do people get bored and drop off? Why, what are the aha moments? What are the very special parts of the video that maybe we should, um, that maybe we should bring out? So we analyzed, um, we analyzed clickstream uh, data from four different courses in edX, sort of spanning a variety of, uh, of domains here, but not only STEM, but also um, humanities. Um, and we, saw, we see a number of patterns in the way people are watching videos. 
There are people who just watch sequentially. So this is, imagine this is the timeline of the video that we're seeing here. Um, there are other people that watch for a bit and then pause and then keep playing. There are other people who watch and then rewatch parts that maybe they didn't understand or need to understand better. We see people that skip and sort of skim through the video to see what's in it. And we see people who are just jumping around. So all of these behaviors show up, um, and they represent sort of different parts of the video that might be important or might be interesting. So one way that we can aggregate all of this data is to take the traces of the parts of the video that each particular person has watched and simply add them up. And we end up with, this is basically the number of times that each moment of the video has been watched by someone. Um, I'll show you one, one general pattern here is that the trend tends to be downward. The first parts of the video are watched much more often than the, the last parts of the video. But then we also see these peaks that have drawn many people using different strategies into that part of the video. And those are, those are uh, uh, significant peaks where something is going on that we need to understand. And let me give you some examples of um, what we've learned about some of these peaks. So frequently around these peaks, there is a visual or a topical transition that occurs. So one kind of transition is when um, the video has made a cut. So here it was showing a piece of a Python program that the, the instructor is describing. And then there is a cut to the instructor's head. And what we see after that cut is a lot of people backing up to be able to keep looking at that, that program that they hadn't quite understood yet or they need to refer back to in order to capture. Right? So one way of thinking about this is that this is where the video editor has maybe made a mistake or at least has done something that, that wasn't working for some of our learners, some of our students, in putting that cut in there so soon. Here's another example. So uh, when there's a visual transition just before an interaction peak, that's often a sign that it's a start of new material in this video. And people are coming in here in order to start watching that segment of the video um, in order to get what was in there or, or, or relearn it. <laughs> what we've done with this data is used it to drive some new user interface features in the video player. Right? One way we could use this data is to feed it back to the instructors, and we have done that, but it's expensive to re-record or recut videos. So what we're trying instead is to change the user interface so that the video player will do a better job of making these interaction peaks useful to people. So this is the UI. Um, this part is where the video is playing. There's also a transcript over here on the right, which uh, edX and, and Coursera and many other um, MOOC platforms already have. Um, there's a part right here that I will explain in a moment and a part right here that I'll explain in a moment. So that, that part on the bottom, this actually shows the raw data of other users, other learners who have been watching this video. It's a profile that shows where the interaction peaks are in this video. So you can see which parts of the video other people found useful or interesting. This is actually derived from an old idea in user interfaces called read where or edit where that's similar to finding the parts of a book that are heavily dog-eared or heavily bent because somebody has turned to that part of the book and read it very frequently. So a peak here is like seeing where are the other people in this class paying attention. Maybe I should pay attention to it too. We also use this data to pull out these visual highlights, which essentially capture the key slides, the key moments of that lecture. And we found that they actually correspond very well to where the peaks are. We can also use this to automatically pin a frame after a transition. So if we see many people backing up and going back to you know, a complex slide just before a cut, what the video player will do automatically, it will freeze that frame to the side of the video player while uh, continuing to show um, the playing video so that users don't have to do that backing up themselves. 
So these are some of the things that we can do with, um, with the big data that we get out of people watching. We've done a, a lab study of this using about a dozen students, both from MIT and who are taking a course on uh, MITx, um, in which we gave, gave them LectureScape, which is that UI I just showed you, versus the baseline edX interface, and observed how they behaved, um, and gave them several tasks that simulated what people need to do with videos, not just watch them, but also go back and look for information, um, and go back and find what they need to solve a problem, or go back and summarize for themselves as if they're preparing for an exam what it was that was in the video. So those are the tasks they had to do. Um, here's just a brief summary of the results that we found. So LectureScape enabled them to do a lot more nonlinear navigation through the video. They were using it much more in a um, uh, goal-directed way rather than having to re-watch long stretches of the video. Um, and they were exploiting all of these navigation options that we provided to them. The, um, the roller coaster that told them where the highlights were, the, the, the highlighted frames, and the, the pinning. And uh, one of our learners reported that they just felt it gave them more options and personalized the strategy that they were using to navigate around. They also found when we asked them for themselves, without showing them the data, what they thought the points of importance and confusion were, um, confusion correlated pretty well with the uh, points that were um, coming out of the interaction peaks. Importance also found some of them as well. And I think this is really important that uh, when they were using the LectureScape timeline, they felt like they were there with other people. It wasn't as isolated as an experience as it would otherwise be. Now we're in the process now of integrating this into the edX platform so that we can deploy it at a larger scale and see how it behaves with, uh, um, with a whole classroom full of students. So that's the first part that I wanted to show you, how we can use um, learners' data without actually uh, asking the learners to do something specific. Um, for active learner sourcing, we're going to give learners a specific task to do, a little bit of micro work. And the context in which this is going to happen is in how-to videos. So YouTube is full of millions of informally amateur-produced videos about how to do things, how to create effects in Photoshop, how to cook, how to do makeup, um, how to fix things around your house. Um, <coughs> the challenge with these videos is that the YouTube interface is not really designed for learning. It's, a, it's, it's just a video player. It's hard to tell what's actually going on in these videos. You've got a short summary and you've got a title, but you don't really know what's, uh, what's inside the video. And it's hard to go to specific parts that you might be interested in. In fact, these how-to videos, they're very structured, right? It's a sequence of steps that the demonstrator is going through. So for uh, a video about how to make a cake, there are steps to the cake recipe. First you do this, first you do that, then you do that. Um, and even above that, there are sub-goals of the whole goal of making a cake. And in fact, there's previous work that has shown that people transfer their knowledge much better from one demonstration to another demonstration, to actually making the, a different cake yourself, um, if they're told what these sub-goals are, if they're given the higher level reasons for each of these individual groups of steps. That to make a cake, first thing you do is get all the dry ingredients and mix them together. And then the second thing you do is separately you combine the wet ingredients. That kind of sub-goal information is very powerful for, for learning and for transfer. So what we've done is created a video player that allows us to display these sub-goals and these steps on the left side while you have the video over here. And this acts as a navigation interface as well as basically a summary interface of what's inside the video. Now the challenge, since we've got millions and millions of videos on YouTube um, that don't have any of this metadata, they don't have these steps and these sub-goals, where do we get those steps and sub-goals? How are we gonna get them out of the videos? The way that we're gonna do it is by having the people watching the videos 
give them to us. And this, so this is the learner sourcing idea here, that we're going to get the crowd of people that are doing the learning to do small amounts of work that uh, will improve the video, that will give us this metadata. Essentially, every minute of video that you watch, you'll get a little question. And that question will first be something like, you know, give us the step or give us the sub-goal of the part of the video that you just watched. And it'll be a text box, and you'll type it in. And once we've collected some proposed steps and sub-goals from some learners, then the next learners to get to that point in the video will see those as a little multiple choice question here. Which of these uh, sub-goals or steps proposed by a previous learner is the best description of what you just saw? Choose one. And then there's a third step. Once we've sort of isolated a winner, a most popular choice of how to describe that, that minute or so of video, um, then we have a final proofreading step in which other people will say, yes, that's right, no, that's wrong, he, or here, let me propose another way of saying it. Right? So that workflow, and, and crowdsourcing often has workflows of little steps like this, um, that workflow is now being done by the learners that are actually watching this video. So we've done a, uh, a deployment of this. We deployed a website that uh, had a sample of YouTube videos on specific topics, on web programming and on statistics. And we, uh, um, we advertised it in various ways, social networks and Google ads, and, and attracted a few thousand visitors, of whom about half of the people who came actually participated in the sense that they answered some of these learner sourcing questions. So this already is interesting, that 50% of people on the web who are just watching a, a how-to video are actually willing to answer these kinds of questions, right? Which is one of the one of the questions about this kind of work. And we've gotten about a thousand uh, goals, about a thousand answers through these through these processes, through to get them through these workflows. So these people have actually done some work, even though they're not being um, paid to do it. We went back and, with their permission, identified some of these people and interviewed them to find out what they uh, found useful about this process. Um, one of the things was that it, they said it helped them f pay attention to the video. And you know, Dr. Terman did mention this in, uh, in his talk as well, that doing something active while you are learning really does help you process it better and learn it better. And this is a small bit of active work that does that. Seeing the choices that other people had made helped the learner think that they were on the same wavelength and also made it feel like it was a more social learning process, that there were other people here with the in the video with them. We also asked uh, uh, some of the video creators how they felt about this. And um, having these pop-up questions, they liked it, because it meant that the viewers were actually paying attention to their video. Um, so they thought it was a useful improvement. So I hope I've given you a sense of what we can do with the crowd of people that are um, learning from our materials. Um, and that there are kind of two approaches we can take here. One is the big data approach um, of just watching what they're doing. But there's, there's also an active approach where we actually ask them um, to do some exercises that improve the video. And uh, um, I want to thank the sponsors, including NSF, Quantum Computer, and Google. And, and we also had some great collaborations um, with edX. Thank you very much. Welcome back again after the coffee break. We will, have, we will be starting the third session. The next section will be presented by Professor Ian King, Associate Dean of Education of Faculty of Engineering, CUHK. Professor King is Professor of the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. He is also the Director of Rich Media and Big Data Key Labor Laboratory at the Shenzhen Research Institute. His research interests include machine learning, social computing, big data, data mining, and multimedia information processing. Recently, Professor King has, has been an evangelist in the use of education technologies in e-learning for the betterment of teaching and learning. The title of his talk is Big Education on Keep, Knowledge and Education Exchange Platform. Professor King, please. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, it's okay. 
I, I kind of like to walk around. I'm not going to hide behind the podium. So, um, uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Helen and the organizing committee. I think I'm one of them. So, uh, for inviting me this uh, to this uh, talk, and I really, I really think that this kind of uh, workshop is is fantastic in terms of promoting and uh, encouraging people to do think about e-learning and big data together. So, my my talk today is big education on keep and. Uh, I'd like to just uh, first present to you the state of our education right now. Uh, if you are the teacher right here, can you see that? This is a teacher. And these are the students right here. And uh, if you, uh, uh, this is in Chinese, so, so I'm going to just do the English one. It says our education system. Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, he will live his whole life believing that it is stupid. Okay? And I believe that uh, the new wave of big education we we'll abolish this, okay? We're gonna do personalized uh, uh, learning path. We can do a lot more. But anyway, uh, this, this will serve as a good point to start. Um, the words of wisdom, and I know there's a lot of educators here, so I hope that I'm not gonna offend anybody, but I think that good university focus on counting the number of publications, right? And then uh, better university focus on citation number impact factors. So. What do you think the best university will focus on? <laughs> Education. Yes, yes, that's right. So that's why we're here. Okay, so um, I've been asked, right? So my title is Big Education on Keep. So the, the question is, what is big education? So I'm going to give you a very simple ex explanation. Big education is a man meets a woman, or a boy meets a girl, right? And this guy is Mr. Big Data. And then she is a Miss Education. So you put these two together, I call it the big education. Okay? So, um, and you may know this too. Uh, this is, we're bombarded every day by all sorts of information and, 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 and data. And this is what we call it big data, right? Our life is big life and on big data. Now, you are very familiar with this slide next. Okay? I don't need to describe this. You guys all know the 4V for big data. But did you know that there's also four Vs for education as well? Big education as well? Let me explain to you, right? First of all, the volume, okay? Nowadays, we have so many types of teaching stuff. For example, we have Coursera, edX, Udacity, and uh, Khan's Academy. The available of teaching material online, okay, is overwhelming. That's, that's volume right there, okay? Secondly, Velocity, I think that we all really fall into this. This is the, how do we actually face the change, the rapid change, the pace of change that happens in education, right? The technologies that we use, the pedagogical approaches that we adopt, and all that stuff, okay? So this is really the velocity at which things are changing uh, in education, in big education. That's velocity. The third one is variety. What is variety? Well, there are actually many different ways that we acquire our knowledge these days. We don't do it in the classroom, but we could do it online. We could do it on our phone. And eventually, I'm going to show you something. Maybe it's on our watch. We could actually learn something. So this is the variety of sources that we could, we could get or obtain education and maybe even teach, uh, do teaching on. Okay. So what do you think the veracity would be? What is veracity? Veracity is the uncertainty inside our data. And what, is, what, what would that be in big education? Now, in here, I'd like to show this, because I'm the, actually the creator of Very Guy. Because, the, 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 because of internet, right, people actually make copies, well, could copy materials on the internet very easily. That makes your education kind of uncertain. How did you know that actually you did the work? in big education. What, could it, could it be someone else, right? So I show this very guy right here because uh, we have created this uh, system, plagiarism detection system, to, uh, uh, to, to ensure that we uphold academic quality and academic honesty. And that's what I call the veracity in big education. So how do we actually find the, uh, the, the truth about our education? So these are the four things. And my favorite thing is that uh, out of all this, right, <laughs> there is a value issue, 
right? We, can, we have all these things. We have all these new MOOC courses. We have all these ways to, to, to learn on a mobile phone. But really, is there value in all these things that we do? And I believe that it is. There is the value that we have. OK. So, and I want to also extend this, too. Um, uh, you know, this is really an a education timeline. And most, most of the stuff that I'll be talking about perhaps is focused on here. But I like to remove that myopic vision, and I like to suggest that big education is really about lifelong learning, okay? Big education is not only applicable to the university, but also applicable to professional certificates, lifelong learning, and all the way extend out to even kindergarten. How do we actually track their performance? How do we encourage them learning, creativity, and so on and so forth? And that, I think that's really important. OK, so teachers, uh, this is a slide I like to show because uh, that looks like me, OK? Because uh, for me, in the world of big data or big education, it seems like I need to learn all sorts of skills, new skills, new technologies, and new ways to do teaching and learning and all that. Although I'm a, teach I'm a teacher, but at the same time, I'm also a learner, right? So I feel like I'm this person right here. I need at least four arms to do all the tasks that I have. So the question is, shall we actually all become Superman and Superwoman and super kids? Okay. Um, I think not. I think not. I think really the task of our modern educator is not to cut down jungles, but to irrigate deserts. And that's what the purpose of me being here. I hope this is fun, right? Is this fun? Yes. Okay. I hope so. Okay. So. I'm going to just give you a few things about uh, trends in big education before I go into uh, KEEP. Okay, so there's a couple of things I've been observing the last few years, and I think it's worth taking them out and uh, kind of examine that. And uh, one, first, I'd like to actually show you the online learning landscape, okay, because that is about big, big education. And uh, you can see that online open, uh, universities, MOOC sites, platforms, search reviews. This is really all the companies. So we, now we have really an ecosystem now. We have a huge ecosystem that, uh, and, and has a really nice landscape and on various uh, 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 aspects of e-learning and on big education. But I'm going to show you uh, the next couple of things. I'm going to use these three things criteria, collaboration, cost effectiveness and customization as a ways as a characteristic of the things that I'm going to uh, share with you, OK? So collaboration, cost effectiveness, and customization. The first thing I, want, I think that the trend in, in big education is that uh, uh, multimodal learning. So people, students, in fact, acquire knowledge from different sources now. It is not good enough to just put your things on your website but you might have to saturate it on YouTube, on Coursera, on different things. Here is an example. Harvard has presence on their website, on YouTube, on Class Central, on edX, on iTunes, and you know, so on and so forth. So they saturate the whole social media scenes and all the potential channels uh, because people, in fact, acquire knowledge differently and uh, we don't want to just have one way and one way of doing things. We want to be able to actually have multiple ways and multiple ways for them to get obtain knowledge. So this is one trend that we've been seeing. Another thing I've seen in the last really a few years is this. We, as educators, we start with a course. We have material, pull material together. We, we create a course. And then we made that course online. We put that thing electronically. We put it on our website, on our Dropbox or whatever. We make that online. Then we made that open, open to the university and uh, uh, maybe other departments and so on and so forth. And the last frontier really is to make that massive open online course. And what does that say? It's the acronym is for MOOC, right? So yes, MOOC is one of the things that is, uh, is a trend that we're seeing. Um, um, Next, I want to say something about this. In fact, I'm a proponent to this thing because it's a small private course with degree because this is what university will exist for, is, is the face-to-face -face interaction, is the time that you can spend with your teacher and with the student. That really matters. 
MOOC is a little bit, how should I say, impersonal, right? It could be, because the, the, the engagement and the interaction is not there. But, but uh, there are successful cases, for example, small private online courses with degree. Uh, AT&T uh, joined with the Georgia Tech and Udacity, for example, will offer uh, tailor-made professional courses, okay? Uh, and uh, they could get degrees from this. And I think that is the trend, coming trend in the future. Okay, another thing, I, I don't need to talk too much, is like preaching to the choir is a flipped classroom, but uh, more and more people are doing this. Uh, we're having better technology and better pedagogy on how do you flip a classroom? How do you make the classroom flip classroom interesting? And so on and so forth. So this is another trend in, uh, in e-learning. So this is, a, this is the flipped classroom. Another thing is we are also doing, in fact, in Chinese U, is to convert a lot of the material that we have into micro modules. Okay, so we are, what we were trying to do is to break down a big concept into smaller pieces, right? Each video could be five to 10 minutes long. And with, actually, I'm gonna show you what our implementation of this uh, micro learning looks like with links and so on and so forth. This will facilita facilitate learning because we found out, uh, you know, younger generation, they have the attention span of a gnat, right? So that's like a, like a fraction of a second. So uh, five minutes to six minute video is probably the most optimum thing that they could actually do. So, uh, but on the other hand, the micro uh, module can also facilitate uh, personalized learning path. Because once you have broken the component down, you could actually create different paths for different people depending on the person's preference and person's, uh, per, uh, the person's needs and so on and so forth. So that's, that's actually very, very important. Next thing, oh yeah, so that is related to what I'm gonna talk about. The, the micro uh, moduling uh, is really also uh, uh, is related to the what, uh, what personalized learning right here. So in here, what you could do uh, one could do is to create their learning path, okay? So this is, this is quite important, but it really, we need that micro module first that, uh, before we could actually do this well. Okay, so um, another thing that we also found out is this, right? The, uh, the, the outcome, the performance actually increased when you could do activity inside the classroom. And this is the reason give rise to also flip classroom. So you do the homework inside the class. You do activities. So active learning is one of the things that we will highly recommend. Now it's good for engineers because like you teach a programming class. You don't just talk about programming. You actually do programming inside class. I, talk, I teach uh, data structure. We want to do algorithms. So we want to do the algorithm right there and then. Uh, you get immediate feedback. You know what you, whether it's right, what is wrong, and so on and so forth. So active learning is also another aspect. Lastly, but not least, is, uh, is something that, uh, you know, that cannot be done perhaps uh, before, but now it, we could do this on a large scale, is peer learning, right? Um, uh, we had classes here uh, that connected to a massive amount of uh, international students. So when we had Occupy Central, for example, I mean, people were asking, you know, how do you guys feel? What is the situation there? So other people, uh, from other parts of the world will be able to learn something that they were not able to do before. So peer learning and peer assessment and, and, and so on and so forth is also a very, very important component in this big education thing, okay? So, and how, many, how much time do I have? 10 minutes, perhaps? Okay, so with that in mind, I'd like to just share, uh, use the next few minutes to share with you KEEP, okay? KEEP. It's an, it stands for Knowledge and Education Exchange Platform. And, um, and what it is, is simply, it's a multi-year cross-institutional project with all the institutions in Hong Kong. So we really say that this key project represents all Hong Kong's institutions, okay? Um, uh, KEEP is basically a big data learning analytic platform that will allow uh, uh, teachers and students to experiment with different uh, type of blended learning. We, uh, we also serve as a creative online learning gateway for educators, and we encourage and promote flexible and active learning on the KEEP platform. KEEP is a knowledge aggregator, I'm gonna show you why, and a technology integrator. So with that in mind, I wanna share your vision. We KEEP 
would like to empower people by providing and promoting the best education resources in order to facilitate collaborate, collaboration and innovation for teaching and learning through knowledge aggregation and technology integration. I know that's pretty long, right? I made that up. I, I, I did. It's a, it's a long, but I think that you describe precisely what we want to do, okay? Very precisely of what we want to do. Uh, our mission is to, uh, to organize education resources uh, as a single centralized point, so you don't have to go to different places to search for Coursera or edX or whatever. You just come to here and you will, you will get that. We also want to offer a recommended personalized learning path and, uh, and, and, and provide insight for uh, learning analytics. And uh, we want to deliver the best practice uh, on courses, on material, on product, on service, on software, on our hardware related to teaching. That's what we want to do. And lastly, we want to build a, a platform that will facilitate the innovation uh, uh, development of education software. That's what we want to do. So four things right here. I'm going to, uh, so, so this, is, this is UGC funded. All A of these uh, are in the project. And here is uh, what we want to do is we want to use Amazon's web services. We talked to Google already. I'm also talking to Microsoft and see what they could uh, help us in terms of the cloud and services and also uh, their interest in e-learning as well. And uh, these are some of the people we already have uh, a very close tie with. For example, I just came back from a Coursera uh, conference uh, uh, last week, and uh, we've been talking to edX and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, with that in mind, I'd like to just briefly show you, this is probably the most technical thing you will see, okay? But this is, a, this, is, this is a four components that we have. First is the search engine right here, content. We, we will crawl our local website, education-related uh, material, and, and, and put that, oops, put that, in a, put that in a, on our uh, search engine. Second is we tie with universities' a, a database system so that we will know who's logging in and uh, also track their behavior and so on and so forth. Third is that we interface with Coursera, with edX, with Udacity, and Moodles, and so on and so forth. So we will run these platforms on our system, okay? So when you access uh, these, uh, these other learning management system, we will actually get a record. That's, that's at least our hope. And the last thing here is that we encourage innovate, innovative uh, 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 educational software to be developed on key platform. We will provide APIs so that we could collect also analytic information when you develop that. Okay, so with that, uh, I'm gonna just show you a few, uh, um, a couple of uh, apps. The first thing is Keep Search. You can see that it's almost like a Google search, but it's better. Better in the sense that, okay, better in the sense that um, it only will provide you with educational resources. It will not give you all sorts of junk, right? And we actually cluster the result in such a way that you could see what are the cluster inside that search, okay? And then we could actually direct you to edX things or Coursera material and so on and so forth. So that's our search engine. We're gonna do more hopefully in the future, okay? The Keep course right here is really our course that you could get on to Keep and start a course using one of our farm's uh, tools. Uh, so we have Moodle, for example. We have Open Canvas. We have Open edX. And then uh, we also run uh, Google's uh, Course Builder. Okay, so all these things are available on Keep. Now you could create a course with that on Keep right now, okay? Um, the Keep catalog is a way that we want to showcase the best practice in terms of software, hardware, and services. So we will provide you with all these, you know, how do you actually use YouTube inside the education environment? Did you, know, did you know you could use YouTube very effectively? I know it doesn't happen in China. Okay, okay. But, but you, you could do YouTube very nicely, right? How do you use LinkedIn? How do you use all these different products that could facilitate big education? Okay, so we, we will have this available for you with reviews, with uh, you know, recommendations, and so on and so forth. Oh, I wanna just say something about Keypoll. Keypoll is a polling software that we, we have developed. Uh, it's, it, it's on, oops, is on 
desktop is on, uh, it's on the mobile phone. And in fact, I just got this uh, this week that we're able to put it on the Apple Watch. Okay, so I'm gonna show you that a little bit later. What this is, is basically, it, it's a polling system, a survey system that will help to uh, improve student engagement as well as uh, you know, the teacher will be able to uh, get a quick assessment of their teaching quality. For example, do you know this particular topic, yes or no? We'll give you multiple choices that you can actually do very quickly. So with that, I'm gonna just show you this. Is this, uh, is this, let me see, yeah. So right here is this. This is actually a poll. I asked the question, when, do you, when would you like to take the programming midterm in my data structure class? Is it Thursday, uh, is it Thursday, March 19, March 26, or April, whatever? Here is the analytic that, this is the voting has been done. 20 people think this day, 22 people think this day, 25 people would prefer this day, right? So this is just a question. Here is actually a simulated Apple Watch, okay? This is from the Apple simulator. And we are able to push this, and this is very special. We're not pushing to every, everyone. We're, we're, we're actually working with Apple iBeacon, so when a, when a teacher is sending out this question, it will only send to those people they share the same iBeacon ID. Okay, so I'm not sending out this to everybody in the world. I'm actually doing a location-based service using this. And furthermore, you could, you could do this on the watch. So in one day in the class, there's no more clickers. You don't need to use your phone. You could just look at your watch and tell the teacher whether you like him or not, okay? <laughs> so vote for me, right, vote for me, okay. So, so, so this is something that we just did a few days ago, so I'm so excited to, to show you this. Um, okay, the next thing that I wanna share with you is what we call a Keypedia. What is Keypedia? The way I describe it is YouTube meets Wikipedia meets Pinterest, okay? If you think about that, this is a micromoduling YouTube with Wikipedia information. So there is a text that surrounded that particular video. So it's not just a video, six minute video, but it will be the prerequisite, the reading material, the quizzes, and so on and so forth associated with that. Right? And then done in a way that is like a Pinterest that is really interesting. So you combine these three, you have what we call a Keypedia right here. And each one of this is a short video, and then with a related linked, linked, data, like a Wikipedia, that could go to different parts of this huge universe right here. Okay, uh, Keypository is something that I think maybe is good for the student. I, th I thought it was good for the student and also for the teacher. This is really, we are trying to create a crowdsourced question base, okay, for teachers and students, you know? We teachers always afraid, oh, we don't want to reveal the question to the students but that's the way they learn. So why not just give it out to them, right? So if we have a crowdsourced thing right here, uh, we could actually put questions into this repository. I could create a survey, like the, the Apple Watch survey very quickly, or I could create quizzes or examinations based on the repository. Student will be able to use this repository to play games, okay, to answer questions, and then go to the next question, and so on and so forth, because there are different levels of questions that we could make this interactive, and so on and so forth. So this is the key posture we're building right now, okay, for that. Lastly, the key apps. So these are some of the apps, and Helen, you're gonna give me an app too, right? On a, on a speech assessment thing. But we have Very Guy app, an easy scripter app that is sitting on top of uh, on the key platform so that they will be collecting also analytic information and send this back to the, uh, the, to, the, to the respective teachers and the university as well, okay? So this is what we plan to do. There's some work in progress. Uh, I said before, learning and education analytic is the next phase. We're gonna include lots of game stuff in there. So how do we, how do we gamify? How do we make learning interesting, right? So we have the repository here. So we could play a game like a risk. So when you solve a problem, you increase your territory. When you create an interesting problem, you defend your territory. So you can play this game in, with this key repository, okay? And that's what we want to build. 
We want to do more on social collaborative things so that peer learning and peer, uh, 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 peer, learning and peer assessment can be done very easily and, and, and efficiently and precisely. Because right now, it is you know, not, not there yet. We also want to go into the mobile and the wearable education technologies, like what we talk about using watch and other things. Okay, so these are some of the up and coming. Um, my background is in machine learning and, uh, and natural language processing and information retrieval. So we hope to actually include, for example, text semantic analysis, sentiment analysis, question and answer, uh, a better question and answer system inside the key. We also want to do recommendation uh, for personalized uh, learning path, career, planning, and so on and so forth, okay? And uh, knowledge map, um, don't worry about this. Uh, and then uh, powerful search engine, we want to do this. We want to be able to actually search for notes, equations, videos, and so on and so forth, okay? And uh, algorithm technology, this is where I, I live. This is my universe, so it's machine learning, data analytic, social computing, web intelligence, and multimedia information processing. So we hope to really use what we have done in the research and apply this in education in a big way. Okay, so that's why I call it a big data on Keep. Okay, so um, I hope that you guys will get involved. So feel free to contact me. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, I, I, I end with this. It says this. Uh, do you know what clouds are made out of? You say, sure, music files, right? But I hope, I hope one day the question will be, do you know what Keep Education Cloud is made out of? And then you'll answer, sure, a fantastic search engine, organized education resources, insightful analytics, and innovative apps, and a lot more, okay? So I end with, you with that, and I thank the, the team here and all the collaborator, co i and advisor, and uh, my co-PI uh, co here. I thank them for this uh, wonderful project that I'm able to actually be involved with. And that's it, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor King. We're honored to have Professor Victor Shu, Delta Electronics Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. MIT CSEL as our last speaker. Professor Xu has spent more than three decades at MIT. He studied and codified the acoustic magnification of speak, speech sounds in American English and the subsequent application of this knowledge in the development of spoken dialogue interface to make human-computer interactions easier and more natural. After a 10-year hiatus serving various stewardship positions at MIT, he has returned to teaching and research in 2011. His current research interests are in the area of applying human language technologies to enable easy access of structured and unstructured information from the web, especially in online education. Nope. Professor Su is a fellow, fellow of the Acoustic Acoustical um, Society of America and a f fellow of the International Speech Com Communication Association. He is also a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering and a uh, accommodation of the Commander in Seneca in Taiwan. He received the Okawa Prize in 2012 and the IEEE James L. Flanagan Speech and Audio Processing Award in 2013. The title of his talk is Using Human Language Technology to Improve MOOC Learning. Professor Xu, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, for those of you who uh, did not know, I used to be a student at CUHK. Uh, actually, it was before CUHK, called Sun Ah. Uh, and my best friend during that day was Professor Li Tianbing. Uh, we were not very good students, but uh, we had a lot of fun. Uh, anyway, like Helen, uh, I spent most of my professional life uh, on the development of human language technologies. 
human language technology means enabling machine to recognize speech or synthesize speech or understand natural language and uh, uh, generate natural language or worry about modeling discourse and dialogue, these areas. So it's, uh, it's not a surprise, perhaps, that um, after uh, being away for 10 years, uh, helped to, to run the lab, uh, I returned after the sabbatical in Asia to go back to human language, but trying to apply that to the problem of uh, how to improve group learning. I think it's really interesting. It's hard to imagine that it has been less than four years since the first course in MOOC was uh, offered. Uh, in three and a half years' time, we have really done a lot in this area. However, when you think about e-learning, I think we're doing a lot of e, but are we really doing a lot in learning? So I think this workshop is particularly appropriate at this time. Um, so it's a bit like uh, Okay, lots and lots of nations are trying to fight out market shares, but fundamentally, I think we need to understand how a new way of interacting with students is going to help us improve learning, and I think this is what uh, we are here uh, to talk about. So, um, I should say that the work is done with uh, my student and 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 uh, Dr. Hong Yi Lee who uh, spent a year at MIT, and now he's a professor at the National Taiwan University, working in this area. So, uh, so human language technology and MOOC, uh, these two things are related. Because so much of our uh, courseware, human language is a part of education, whether it's going to be textbook and slides or lectures or, or discussion, something to do with, uh, with uh, natural language. And, but what uh, MOOC offer uh, are, are two big challenges. The first one, in my mind, is heterogeneity. You know very little uh, uh, um, about the background of the people, and the di background can be extremely diverse. You have high school students, you have retirees trying to do something, or someone in mid-career trying to change uh, from one profession to another. Their learning style is different, their language is different, uh, Chinese versus Indian versus European. And uh, also, uh, the, the uh, preparedness uh, is different. So it's very uh, heterogeneous. If you're coming to CUHK, you're teaching a class here, you have a pretty good idea about the background of your students. And part of the challenge is how to deal with this diverse background for the students. And the second thing has to do with scale. You have heard a number of people talk about that. And you basically cannot have a one-size-fits-all type of way of learning. This is a direct consequence of the heterogeneity of, of our, our uh, student body. What we need to do is to worry about mass customization. Okay? It almost sounds like an oxymoron, but it is really true. You want to be able to customize for individual uh, uh, learners. And that's what we're trying to do. Now, human language technologies, I believe, could help. It could help us process and manage a large amount of content. You can do that. You can develop speech-based interfaces. Rather than typing or clicking, maybe it will be easier for you to have a search engine that you can interact with using uh, human language. Uh, but you really need to worry about how to develop general and scalable solution whenever it is possible. All right. So what are we talking about in terms of human language technologies application to the problem of MOOC? Uh, many, many different things you can do. But first of all, if the lecture is given uh, in, in voice, what you really want to do is to be able to transcribe that. Currently, it is done by humans, because if a course has 100,000 students, for example, you can afford to create a, a, a high class a transcription by asking people to type it in. Uh, but, of course, that, there will be a delay between the time that you, you, you offer the course and when you uh, have the transcription. Uh, you can do some machine translation, uh, uh, turn it into multiple different languages. You can do that. But it's a long-term uh, uh, research problem. Translation technology has advanced significantly over the last decade. However, it's not good enough. And if you want to use machine translation of the material, uh, it, had, it better be as perfect uh, as you can get. 
And you can worry about problems in, in language technology to do uh, user identification and authentication. If you're going to offer a grade or a certificate, you certainly want to know that the person taking the exam is exactly the same as the person who registered to take the course, right? And then there is a very large area in terms of information management, how to characterize the information. If you have a, a discussion forum with thousands and thousands of entries, how can you tell? Put them into categories. These having to do with confusions on lecture three, slide 17, for example. Or you want to have, say, uh, things that have something to do with the, the uh, examination schedule, administrative issues, you want to be able to do that. And an area that I'm going to spend some time on is this issue of linking. How can you take different kinds of courseware and you try to combine them together, link together in such a way you can have easy access, for example. And then you have other problems in information management having to do with summarization. How can you say, give me a five minute summary of that lecture? Or maybe a 15 minute summary to be able to customize it to people's needs. A sort of a, a computer generated uh, cliff notes, if you will. And finally, you want to worry about search. You want to make it easy for people to find the information uh, that they need. Now, uh, we are at, uh, at CCL, we are mostly spending time on these categories. So today, I want to show you some of the work that we are doing in this area. Now, before I move on to that area, I just want to reinforce something that you have heard a number of times today, uh, but I want to do it with some data, OK? And the, the issue is that online and residential courses are different in many aspects. Now, Helen uh, finished this morning's talk with a slide that shows uh, there is residential in, uh, education, there's online education. People who are doing residential uh, education, uh, like most of us, uh, are a little apprehensive about that, right? Are, are we going to? If we pursue online education, are we going to uh, basically work ourselves out of a job? Uh, uh, but I think it's, it's an interesting pro problem. And we, uh, the way I would prefer to think about it is the same way that Helen is thinking about it, that at the moment, uh, the, the, the flow of information and technology is one way. What we're trying to do is to say, OK, here are the courses that you're teaching on campus, and how can that be made into online courses. But in the end, the combination of e-learning and big data is going to inform us of the ways that it will benefit residential uh, uh, education. And, and uh, you have seen some examples of that. So I wanted to show you a couple of slides, some comparisons. Now, we've been looking at between 25 and 30 courses being offered uh, on MITx and also uh, 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 taught uh, on campus. Uh, so the comparison is really nice if you have this many courses. So in particular, I want to focus on one course, which is uh, Introduction to Computer, uh, uh, computer Science. And, and people like to say this is a course about Python. Uh, and the interesting thing is that that course has been offered four times online. And we have data for three times on MIT campus. Furthermore, that's pretty much taught by the same professor. So we can actually compare these two things and try to understand. You know, we, we, we neutralize a lot of the variables. So multiple offering of the same course at MIT and on edX. And then what we're trying to do is to compare those two courses in terms of many different dimensions. Uh, the, the, the class size, the, how many people actually drop out of the class, and the manner of interaction the role that teachers play versus the roles that the peers play. And we find some interesting uh, uh, comparisons. Here's an example. Uh, on the left-hand side, we're talking about measurement on online version of the same course and residential version of the course over here. Each one of these, this is one offering. On, uh, 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 this is uh, the course cost 600. It's in the fall term of 2012, summer, uh, spring term of 2013, et cetera, et cetera. There are four offerings. Am I making myself clear? OK. Now, here we have three offerings of the same course on campus. 
So you can look at this and you see, for example, the enrollment. You can see red is the total number of enrollments. That's measured in terms of tens of thousands of students. Whereas on campus, you're looking at uh, two or 300 uh, students. And this particular one is a, a, a high, uh, the last time it was offered. If you look at the green one, that says how many people who actually passed the course, they were certified. You will see that on campus, the number of people who starts and the one who finishes are more or less the same. Of course, there are people who are dropping off, but not too much. Whereas if you look over here, compare the red with the green, you see a dramatic difference in terms of dropout rate, right? Another example, of, I mean, uh, I'm just trying to make a, a, a few points here, is that if you were to look at this problem of threads, that is in the discussion forum, how many different postings of the thread exist? Then you will see that of these threads, the orange one that you have, how many of those were answered by the teaching staff, and how many of those were answered by your peers, your students, okay? On campus, you see, by far, you know, a lot more questions were answered by the teaching staff, the purple. And here, so few were answered by the teaching staff, you can't even see it, okay, on this scale. Most of the questions were answered by your peers. So in fact, the interaction is very different. So it's not the case we can just graph the way we interact on campus and move it on to online, and in fact, these things are very different. You might ask, why is it that we have so many people dropping out? If you look at the marketing data, it says hundreds of thousands, millions of thousands of students have enrolled in a, a course. But if you were to look at it, looking at the data, honestly, this is the data uh, uh, provided by Professor John Gutak, who is the instructor for that Python course. And if you look at it, this, you will see that, in fact, this is the distribution. This is plotting how much time a person spent in a course. And this is a histogram, OK? So what happened is that this is actually the distribution of the students who finished the course, all right, and the amount of time they spent. And over here, the overwhelming, the gray ones are the ones who are, uh, for whatever reason, started the course but didn't finish. Now you say, why didn't they do that? Well, maybe in the very beginning, somebody who spends you know, a few minutes, maybe they're just shopping. They get into the course, take a look, and say, huh, eh, I don't want it, OK? And there are other ones who begin to spend some time. And eventually, you see it's people using tens of hours maybe here. This happens to be the piece that at least I am interested in. I want to say, if there is a way, maybe that's because they're not getting enough help. Maybe because their background is not sufficient. Uh, so what we want to do is to figure out ways to actually take some of these and move them over to the other side, as Chris has mentioned earlier, the distribution. Okay. All right, so I'm going to spend the remaining time talk to you about a couple of things that we're doing in the area of linking. And this is the work done uh, uh, by one of my students, uh, Daniel Lee. And the idea is to figure out ways of linking the material together. So what we are trying to do is to say the following, OK? Uh, we have all kinds of things, lectures and uh, textbook and slides and all those things. Each one can serve, we believe, a reinforcing role. So if you can take all that information and try to link them together so when you're talking about a given uh, topic, you can link the appropriate segments of the te textbook and the discussion forum, the slides, and the, the, the videos together. We thought this might be a good way of helping people, OK? So what we want to do is to link those things together and create sort of adaptive learning environment for students to navigate freely. So our hypothesis is the following. 
Okay? It says, if you can organize the courseware in a way that is easy for people to navigate and look for things, then perhaps it's going to improve learning. So today, the way we do it, the unlinked way, whether it's, uh, for example, the red one might be the video like, of the lectures, this one might be the problem sets, the other ones may be uh, uh, the textbook. They are basically organized as uh, monolithic, uh, independent pieces. And what we want to do is to move into this area in which, in fact, they are linked. For this particular topic in the lecture, the appropriate other kinds of courseware, sometimes you have more choices and other times you have less, uh, are linked together. The hypothesis is that if we do this, it's going to improve learning. And to, to put it uh, concretely, what we're trying to do is to build two types of interfaces. In, the one, in one case, the video, the books, and other things are done independently, presented to the user independently. And in another case, uh, things that are related to, uh, uh, are linked together. So at the same time, they are at your disposal. You can find the information and presumably learn more. Now, learning is a very hard thing to measure. And what we're trying to do is to think about sort of derivative, the properties of learning. And what we would, would like to do is to say, if we present interface one, unlinked, compare it to the linked method, we want to measure how well people can look for information, for example, when they're doing a problem set, and how well can they recall the information, the concept retention. These are some of the problems that we're asking ourselves, okay? So could it really help? And what we're trying to do is to conduct a crowdsourcing uh, experiment. Um, uh, you have heard uh, uh, Rob Miller talk about that, so I won't uh, elaborate. So what we're trying to do is to take a course. In this particular case, we look at a, a, a statistics course from UC Berkeley. And it has videos, it has slides, it has textbooks, and, and this kind of thing. And what we're trying to do is to use the Amazon Mechanical Turk, the micro uh, uh, task uh, workers, to, uh, to, to be the subjects. And um, they have varying backgrounds. Some people have college degrees. Some people don't have college degrees. Some people have taken MOOC before, and some other people have not. And some uh, have taken statistics before, and some have not. Okay. So we were doing in, in, in an experiment. It says, well, if we can link it, would it make any difference to, the, to these, uh, these subjects? And the ground truth is actually done by human experts that link them together. But since then, we have uh, created automatic uh, techniques to link these things together. At the moment, we want to know the best possible uh, 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 consequences. And uh, we measure information search, how fast and how accurately can you look for information. So you say, uh, uh, doing a homework problem, you need to know about regression in, 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 uh, in statistics. How, how fast can you find the information? Uh, and then concept retention, you say, well, this segment, please summarize it. And we try to measure how many things that we taught you that you can actually recall, for example. Again, the whole bunch of things uh, that we talk about, I just want to pick one uh, to show you. And uh, so here is one that, that has to do with information search. You ask the person to retrieve a piece of information after they have taken the course. Uh, and uh, here is an example. Let me explain this plot for you. Remember, I have two different interfaces. One is unlinked, all right? And here is linked interface, and I'm asking people to retrieve the information. The idea is if linking really helps, it's going to be faster, right? So I take the amount of time that you will use to look for unlinked, subtract the time that you use to, to, to solve the problem by, by the linked interface, and if that number is positive, it provides indication that, in fact, it's good, all right? So overall, we found that in the tasks that we provide to people, they do it maybe 40 to 45 seconds faster on the average across all the users. Now here is what's interesting. We have these three categories, people with some college degree, 
and some uh, not. And so what we have is um, um, uh, differences between these two, and we can measure sort of the statistical significance of that. I think the check mark might have been in the wrong place. Uh, no? No. Yeah. This is people who, with a college degree already, this is the, the more novice part uh, of the population. People have never taken a MOOC course before. And the significance is uh, statistically, uh, I mean, the, the results are statistically significant. So what it appears to be the case is that linking will improve the speed in all cases. And I haven't shown you the accuracy. It turns out the accuracy in both conditions are about the same. So it gives some evidence of the fact that if you can link the data together, and a number of speakers before me have talked about that as well, that it would help the novice users. So those people, remember I said we want to move it towards certification, they want to complete the course, we want them to, to, uh, to succeed, and I think linking might be one of the answers. All right? So as I mentioned to you before, since then we have done some automatic means of taking the course material and try to link it together, and we have some very good results. And the improvement, the most important thing is you didn't sacrifice accuracy. All right? OK, so let me change the topic into a different kind of linking. And this has to do with uh, linking courses from different places. Let's say in edX, you can have a course on machine learning taught at Berkeley. You have a course on machine learning taught at Columbia University. And some, maybe one lecturer will explain things better than the other lecturer, for example. So what we want to do is to be able to say, take a bunch of courses that's coming in, and you want to link the courses and find out across different courses what, say, you want to learn something, uh, a, a concept like regression. Uh, you want to see how this teacher will teach and the other teacher will teach it so you can link the material that way. And also, you can actually, based on this, be able to figure out what are some of the prerequisites. If I'm confused, I want to know how far back I have to go to pick up the necessary background information. If I'm bored because I already learned this information, how I want to move on to the next level of, of, of uh, more advanced material. So this thing is done in about half a dozen steps, and I will quickly go through it with you, OK? The first is to gather the data. You take all the course material across not only different universities, but different platform. In fact, this thing I will show you later, we take a, a Coursera courses and edX courses, and we can deal with that simultaneously. Collect the video clips and collect the, the MOOC uh, across different MOOC and that's the first step. The second step is we try to extract automatically the key terms in each one of those lecture uh, vignettes, if you will. And, uh, and based on the audio transcription and different kinds of things, for example, one of the things we do is to tag automatically the parts of speech uh, uh, for, the, for these uh, uh, cases. And then we pick out the nouns and noun phrases and consider them to be candidates, all right? And then we are going to filter by some lexical uh, statistics. Uh, for example, in our case, we were using TFIDF, you know, term frequency, inverse document frequency type of measurement. Once that is done, we get a bunch of down, uh, phrases, uh, for, uh, for example, for a, a computational biology course. The third step is you begin to extract the relationship. And what you want to do is to be able to form uh, the relationship based on these kind of, comp uh, the, on these kind of uh, concepts. So if the transcript said the DNA encodes RNA, it is the material of inheritance. So this pronoun inference, you want to change it to uh, co-reference and turn it into a DNA, OK? Just uh, uh, converting the pronoun into its, uh, its reference. Then you do some syntactic parsing of these sentences, come out with the parsing of the sentence DNA is the material of inheritance, for example. Then what you want to do is to say, I want to extract the relationship between these entities. 
And so what you can do is to say these two things, DNA and inheritance, uh, are related in some way. And the way we want to find that relationship is using the statistical model. In this particular case, for those who are interested, it's called information, uh, open information extraction. Okay? And uh, once you do that, then you can say that's the relationship between two entities, and we can figure out the relationship. All right? The fourth step is to create something we call a knowledge graph. Once you have these entities there, and you can figure out that DNA and inheritance, one is the material for inheritance. And then for DNA, all these links you, you generate automatically, creating something we call a knowledge graph. Okay? Two more steps. Then what you want to do is learn what are the prerequisite concepts for a given entity. What does that mean? Sometimes if a person say, I am lost, we're going to say, oh, let's move on, review some of the material so that you can go, uh, to move forward. So the way we do that is to actually uh, try to figure out the relationship. And uh, here, let's use these two examples, OK? So uh, we're here. Uh, what you're trying to do is just to say, all right, DNA happens to be first introduced in lecture three, whereas the, the idea of inheritance was first introduced in lecture one. And therefore, one is the background material from lecture one for three. So inheritance is the prerequisite. Similarly, if you were to look at DNA and RNA, this is first done in lecture three, this is done in lecture 10. So this must be more advanced material. And we can figure out this kind of relationship. Okay. All right. So then you do this whole thing for different courses, maybe one at Berkeley and maybe one at uh, uh, Columbia or MIT and Stanford. And uh, what you really want to do is to use this technique in, in, in natural language processing called uh, vector space models. And that's basically a way of representing a, a paragraph, if you will, in terms of a vector. A vector consists of the different uh, terms. And uh, you want to be able to do that. And when, whenever two of the courses, uh, two pieces are, are uh, very close in terms of uh, similarities, uh, similarity as measured by something called cosine similarity, then we can link them together to be able to do that, all right? So that's pretty much it. And later on, if somebody say, I don't understand DNA, then you can say, well, you should, you know, maybe you should look for, look for something about the, uh, 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 the lectures about the prerequisite. If you say, I know this already. Tell me more about other things. Then you will figure out something else. So uh, I don't know whether I'm going to be successful in playing this video. If not, I have to uh, do that. This is a uh, 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 one and a half minute video, would it work? Huh? No sound? In many courses available on the internet using different platforms such That's as okay. Coursera and edX. If a student wants to learn something about language models, for example, he or she can type a search uh, query. Sorry, I'm going to start from the beginning. The increasing popularity of massive open online courses, or MOOCs, has resulted in many courses available on the internet using different platforms such as Coursera and edX. If a student wants to learn something about language models, for example, he or she can type a search query into the lookup window and receive several course suggestions. However, there is no easy mechanism for the student to determine how the courses are related and which one to choose. The problem is even harder if one wants to search across multiple platforms. Tangjie is a tool developed at MIT to help students taking MOOC courses to visualize the relationship among many courses from multiple online MOOC platforms. By linking these materials together and presenting them in an intuitive interface, Tangjie can potentially help a student customize their learning environment by choosing the suitable learning paths reviewing background materials, or skipping ahead to more advanced topics. The linking is achieved using human language technology. In this demonstration, 
After a student types language model into the lookup window, Pang Jie returns two related lectures from Coursera, one from Stanford and one from Columbia, each highlighted in a different color. The student can retrieve the material by clicking on the corresponding node. Okay, so the first topic we're going to cover in this course is the problem of language modeling. Through automatic linguistic analyses of the transcriptions of the lectures, the system can organize the lectures from these courses into a single map by linking the lectures on the same or similar topic marked in red. For this example, it is clear that the course materials for the two are quite similar for the first several lectures before they diverge. By clicking the red node, the student can compare the two courses on the same topic side by side. In the next example, the student is interested in learning about Python. Tang Jie returns three courses across two different platforms, edX and Coursera. The colored nodes show the various combinations of the three courses. The final example highlights Tang Jie's ability to help a student create a customized learning path. A student interested in learning about DNA can type DNA into the lookup window. Tang Jie then returns several related courses across multiple platforms. The system also links the input key terms with their prerequisite concepts, shown on the upper left. By clicking Inheritance, the material related to Inheritance will be displayed for the student to review. By the same token, the student can skip over the current topic and explore more advanced topics suggested in the upper right. In this example, the student clicks RNA and the corresponding advanced material will be shown. Okay, my time is almost up. So I would just say that we're working on a number of topics uh, at uh, Spoken Language Systems Group. We have already mentioned the automatic content linking. We also are doing some work in topic modeling, uh, video processing, uh, and also in sentiment analysis. So in summary, what I am trying to say here is that we have done some work in the area of applying human language technology to the problem of MOOC. And we have got some interesting results, improvement, extensions, and all those kind of things are ongoing. And we're very interested in finding uh, uh, people, like-minded people, to be working on this and so that we can achieve impact. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Xu. We will now have a Q&A section. May we invite Professor Helen Meng to host this section for us? Thank you very much for the uh, marvelous talks. Uh, so we're actually uh, running a little bit late, and uh, so I, I suppose I should probably keep the Q&A session brief. Um, but may I ask uh, the audience, are there any questions uh, with regards to any of the talks and, and uh, materials that are presented this morning? Yes? So I'd be quite interested in hearing about experiences with or knowledge about uh, adapting um, computer-mediated learning to... In uh, adapting computer-mediated learning to... Um, different personal cognitive styles and abilities um, uh, and things, uh, uh, um, differences in memory, ability, uh, uh, ret retention, the speed it uh, uh, um, uh, takes to commit something to memory to the first time, uh, 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 visual processing, auditory processing, uh, uh, basically different abilities, uh, okay. cognitive abilities, yeah. Okay, would any of our speakers care to share some views. I think, um, I mean, personally, I think having, being able to capture uh, the data trace of the student uh, learning in situ, I think that will reveal a lot of um, the abilities issues that you mentioned. I think uh, we can track the process of learning and, and track understanding, as you could see in, in our last talk by Professor Zhu. Um, I think it will be very revealing. Are, are there any other answers, comments? No? Other questions? Yes, Professor Longi. At the back? Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, um, I think one of the advantages of classroom learning is the instantaneous Q&A, mm -hmm. right? So I just wonder whether this feature, how, can, how to accommodate this feature into e-learning, okay? Because students don't have the advantage of asking the question and then, uh, and then the, student, uh, the teacher will be entertaining the question, okay? So I just wonder, uh, with a class of 100,000 students, you know, how can it be entertained you know, in e-learning? Erwin, I think. Uh, for example, there are uh, some technologies uh, using Q&A, question and answering system. So when you pose a question, we, we actually have a knowledge database that will find similar questions and the answer to that similar questions to you, right? So these are kind of template approach. Then on really on, on MOOC classes, in fact, there are TAs that are standing by in the you know, classroom hours or office hours that will answer, respond to you. So I think, I think there are ways that we could help to answer a particular type of questions. If it's some type of questions, it's like recurring question, that, that's FAQ, right? But sometimes you need to have a face-to-face. -face. Then, then MOOC will provide video, face-to-face -face video link, one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many type of link to, to facilitate that type of things. So we are working on it, trust me. We're working on it. <laughs> have better engagement, right. yes. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, Gloria? It's going to uh, influence the people's way of thinking. So um, how can I teach a primary kid uh, to think like, uh, use the programming mindset to think of that? Because uh, for me, I'm an information engineering student, and I start learning programming when I was in year one. And then it's very difficult for myself to adapt the program <laughs> flow and then the logic thinking, and so and so forth. And so uh, currently, I'm doing some program for the primary kids and the uh, like junior secondary school student about a uh, programming course. And I'm struggling to how to teach them to think on the program, like the way of program, what program think. Yeah, how can I teach them? <laughs> That's a great question, and I apologize I don't have a great answer for it. But <laughs> I, I have to say, I think the first step to teaching children to, you know, uh, computer, computer thinking um, is to learn to do it ourselves. I, I, I think that we have to cross that threshold. Uh, in order to be able to, to teach it. In, in general, it's hard for a teacher to teach something that they haven't internalized themselves. So I, I do think that's the first step. Um, I think that there are lots of resources and lots of people who are thinking creatively about how to use uh, computer-related thinking, even without using computers, uh, in various topics, including a lot of topics that, that children can relate to. And uh, you can learn a lot by exploring these, uh, these sources. So uh, I'm not particularly an expert in them, uh, but uh, and I don't think any of us are. But this is something that is uh, you know, be becoming quite popular. And I think that uh, there's a lot of work out there, a lot of kindred spirits. And uh, doing a little bit of research will give you a lot of clues about how to proceed. Yes, last question, Johnny, Professor Johnny Lowe. This is really a, a blue skies request rather than a question. Uh, when I was a uh, student, uh, the advice I was given is uh, don't pick the course by the content, pick the course taught by the great professors. <laughs> okay. so, so I'm thinking, you know, how can, and part of that great professors is the energy that they generate in the classroom. So I'm thinking, what kind of technologies can we be thinking about that can transmit that energy on a massive scale across the, the MOOCs, you know, just as I guess food programs want to transmit smell. So we want to transmit the energy that's taught by that, that great professor uh, to the millions of people that, that will be taught. So I encourage all the scientists here to think about how we can develop technology to assist the transmission of that enthusiasm and, and in inspiration uh, to massive students. 
Um, that, that's another great comment. I don't think it's a question, but a comment. Um, it occurs to me and lots of other people that with the, uh, as, as education moves online, and uh, you know, many of us think that this is just the beginning of a massive revolution, that education is going to be globalized, uh, you know, professors are going to be sharing their curricular components uh, globally over the internet with, with other professors in various other places. It's conceivable to me that in each domain, there will be emerging a superstar who is the best at teaching that, and because of the global competition in this, you know, this global shared curriculum, uh, you know, the, the, whoever is the superstar is going to emerge and dominate all of the others, and the others will sort of fall by the wayside. Now, that's a little bit unfair. I, I, I think that uh, the right way, the great way of teaching, you know, uh, you know, tensor calculus or whatever is going to be contributed to by lots of people. People will contribute components. But the person who is actually the best at, at presenting them and lecturing uh, may very well emerge as being the you know, recognized expert. So maybe there'll be only one professor, you know, superstar professor in each, each topic. Who knows? My, my colleagues may all disagree. But <laughs> I'm not the keeper of the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So last comment? Yeah, what, one more comment. Great professors can generate energy. Um, now, this, uh, there is another way to generate energy within the learners, and this is not the same way, but uh, the idea of gamification has been applied to various domains. For example, uh, uh, language learning. I do not know how successful um, this can be in various domains, but uh, I think okay. that is one way of generating energy uh, and enthusiasm within students. Okay. So we have... Last request to respond. Our, 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 oh, okay, our, our, one more, okay. Okay, I, I'd like to ask a general question. I think that when we look at online learning, I think one of the benefits is that uh, we can connect the micro modules together uh, into like uh, uh, connecting so that people are trying to learn a topic, you can connect the micro modules to teach them on, on a uh, particular topic. The difficulty that we are seeing now is that this micro modules, each one of them are like a small program or a small programming module. And each one of them may have slightly different input output specifications. And, and when you connect them together from the outside, they may look similar, they may look identical, or they may look uh, connectable. But when you actually put them together, they are not because they make different assumptions, they have different terminologies. And therefore, when you re view them together, they don't make sense. I mean, that, that, that is the difficulty, I think, in online learning. From the, the philosophy, the general philosophy may look good, but there are practical difficulties when you try to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, in, in fact, the talk that I would have given today, if I hadn't been talked out of it by my colleague, Victor, uh, is on precisely that topic. It's something that I'm very interested in. And uh, there's a process that I refer to as commoditization mm -hmm. of soft of courseware um, that I think we need to go through. We need, and uh, you know, we've been through it in many, many other domains. Those of us who are old enough remember when personal computers and dynamic RAMs and so on got commoditized, so that different manufacturers were producing different versions that were all plug compatible. Okay. Uh, we haven't done that in our courseware. As you point out, uh, there are lots of things that are precious nuggets that are taught at MIT, but they're so intricately tied to other things that are taught at MIT that they can't be very easily exported. Okay? Um, my view is that the solution to that problem, and this is a typical you know, straightforward engineering technique that we use in many, many other domains, but not yet in education, the trick is to come up with specifications of each module that are sufficiently uh, accurate that they allow the module to be you know, replaced by some other module that satisfies the same specifications. And uh, you know, a couple of us have been working on a, a system at MIT, a prototype of a system at MIT, 
that does that kind of, you know, provides that kind of specification, we sort of call it a curricular API. That allows, you know, fine-grained modules uh, to be produced by lots of different sources and, you know, different people who produce modules that address the same set of curricular goals are in some sense competing with each other. But we're hoping to be able to enable a global competition so that the best way of teaching, you know, each topic will kind of emerge by, you know, people voting with their feet. Mm -hmm. So. You can give this talk this afternoon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I could. So, Erwin, you have some more? No? Okay, so with that, um, speaking of um, inspirational energy from rock star professors, uh, I'm sure you agree with me that we had a very intensive morning uh, of talks, but may I also reveal, actually, that our distinguished speakers from MIT, they were caught in this uh, flight cancellation problem uh, because of snow in Chicago, so their flights were canceled, and they had to reroute to Toronto, so in fact, they only after a long haul flight, they only arrived in Hong Kong this morning at 5.30. So it's amazing, you know, you still see so much energy from them delivering their wonderful talks this morning. And please join me in thanking them. I'd also like to thank um, Mr. Patrick Hoon, Mr. Ian Hoon, and Mr. Katie Poon from the Sir Stanley Home Medical Development Foundation for such a strong support that make this workshop possible. And, um, and finally, um, uh, our student, uh, our MC, um, Ms. Gloria Satine, and also our wonderful student helpers, please stand up and uh, we, please join me to thank them too. Okay, so with that, I declare the completion of this workshop. We have learned a lot, and we know that we need to work very hard uh, to leverage the potential of e-learning to make education better for ourselves and for our next generation. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Professor Mang. We will be, this will be the end of the CHK MIT John workshop and e-learning and big data.